there, uh, before we head to the rest of our day and week. We're going to go to 1 Peter chapter number 2 as our uh, passage for Back to Church Sunday. Uh, this passage of scripture is written, uh, attributed to, uh, flows from the ministry, the thoughts, the ideas of the apostle Peter, the Peter who walked with Jesus, the Peter who in many respects was one of uh, those fighting disciples. Peter was somebody, uh, he was a thug. Somebody say amen. He, he came out of this kind of sensibility where he believed in the laying on of hands. Amen. He, they said he had, a, he had a mouth like a sailor, amen. So, 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 so don't think that, you know, Jesus don't appeal to the, you know, curse and fighting folks. Somebody say amen. Now, hopefully over time, that, that kind of, you know, peters out of you a little bit, amen, where you become a peacemaker. Somebody say amen, amen, with your voice and your actions. But how many know God finds you wherever you are? I wish I had a church in here today. The God uh, is not, you know, waiting for some folk to be perfect in order for uh, the resonance of God's activity to take root in your life. But God meets you where you are at. And so Peter, the disciple who had all kinds of roller coaster experiences with Jesus. Peter was one of the first to claim that Jesus was the Christ, but he was also one of the first to deny Jesus. Peter was one of the first to, uh, to, to say uh, to Jesus, man, let's get out of here. Let's not go to the cross. But Jesus was also the first person that uh, told Peter on this rock, your confession, I will build my church. Peter was one of the first people who would not believe that, that, that this was really, uh, you know, a resurrection was going to happen. But he was one of the first people who showed up at the tomb. Peter had a roller coaster experience with Jesus. Peter was not one of these folks who was just all in at the beginning and all the way through. And I find that to be a very important kind of description of what the Christian walk is like, the one that is attempting to follow the ways of Jesus, because how many know you're going to have some ups and you're going to have some downs? You're going to have some challenges. You're going to have some victories. You're going to have some moments of doubt, and you're going to have some moments of great faith. But the through line is that Jesus is with you all of the way. And the hope is that the, the church, the body of Christ, the community of the faithful will be with you along the way as well. Give your neighbor a quick uh, elbow bump and say, hang with me all the way through if you don't mind, amen. Don't run out on me, don't give up on me, but give me some time to catch up with the work that God is doing. And so, First Peter is uh, Peter's first letter that he writes to the people that he's been impacting in the Roman Empire through the message of Jesus after Jesus' uh, 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 ascension, after Jesus dies and, and is resurrected and Jesus is, is hanging out back in heaven. And Peter and the rest of the disciples are trying to figure out what do we do next? What did we do in the meantime? How should we exist in a world that is skeptical at best and at worst totally oppositional to this life, this new way of being, this new way of understanding oneself in the world. And in this regard, Peter becomes, I think, a powerful mouthpiece, a powerful voice, a powerful reflection of encouragement to all of us who would want to follow Jesus well. And this is the description then of who uh, Peter describes we the people of God to be. Verse number nine, I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Uh, it says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Verse number 10 says, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Amen. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. Now, I, I have a couple other versions that I love to just read uh, in, 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 in your hearing just so you can appreciate uh, the different ways that the, some of the translators and the, the editors of our English uh, 
translation process have taken the Greek and, and tried to put it in words that are plain for us to understand. The message translation was written by a guy by the name of Eugene Peterson. It was not intended to be a scholarly translation, but more of a translation used in your devotions. Uh, it was his kind of devotional take on the scripture based off of his uh, kind of Greek study, etc. cetera. Uh, I like kind of how he restates these words. Um, and so in the message translation, it says, but you are the ones chosen by God, chosen for the high calling of priestly work, chosen to be a holy people. God's instruments to do God's work and speak out for God, to tell others of the night and day difference God made for you. From nothing to something, from rejected to accepted. Friends, this world is not your home, so don't make yourselves cozy in it. Amen. That, did that hit you a little differently, amen, didn't that? All right, I'm going to give you two more uh, little hooks in the side translations because I just want you to, you know, get a little, couple little body shots like the GG, Triple G uh, 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 fight last night. Somebody say amen, right? Uh, the NIV, some of us read a lot of the NIV, very standard kind of uh, update close to the King James Version. Uh, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Man, I like that that you are God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into this wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And then the final version is the voice. And this is a, a, a very recent translation, and I like this as well. Verse number nine, it says, but you are a chosen people set aside, somebody say set aside, to be a royal order of priests, a holy nation, God's own, so that you may proclaim the wondrous acts of the one who called you out of icky darkness into shimmering light. Woo, yeah, that does something to you, right? Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received it. Beloved, remember, you don't belong in this world. Amen. 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 God bless the reading of your word. We ask that it be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Hide me behind your cross as I attempt to preach and teach. And I pray that your anointing that makes these things easy may rest on me in Jesus' name. We pray that the people of God say amen. So we're going to talk from the topic today. This is who we are. This is who we are. Why don't you tell your neighbor, neighbor, don't forget who you are. Tell them that. Don't forget. Don't forget who you are. If there is one thing about this season of life, this moment in history, it is true that we as the church are caught in a identity crisis of sorts. Uh, to be church, to be God's ecclesia, as it is said in the Greek, the called out ones, those who gather to follow Jesus, to encourage one another, to be salt and light in the world. Uh, it is a noble calling. It is a noble task in the historical kind of context of so many of our cultural spaces, church, the church, the program of church has been both a blessing and a curse to some uh, in the, the the communities by in many of us or, or where many of us uh, have our deepest origins whether you are uh, you know uh, indigenous uh, person whether you come from uh, the, the, the 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 motherland continent whether you are from uh, certain parts of Europe or Asia uh, the church as a political project infused with imperialism and greed have often introduced God with a sword in God's hand. Uh, I remember Desmond Tutu uh, gave a great talk and a speech, and he said something to the effect that when the missionaries came to Africa, they had a Bible in their hand, and we had the land. And when they left Africa, 
we had the Bible and they had the land. Somebody said it was an uneven exchange, right? That sometimes our faith can be used in such a way that it muddies the call, the reason, the function, and the purpose of why the church was established by Jesus in the first place. How many of you know that, or maybe you don't know, but I'm here to tell you that when Jesus introduced the idea of the church, it was not so it could become the government. It was not so, you know, you could elect the bishop as the emperor or the president or the queen. Amen. In many respects, the church was there to be a catalyst, to be a space where God's creation could literally experience redemption. It could be a consistent reminder of what it means to live in a fallen world with a heavenly and a divine sensibility. And I find that for many of us, it is so important to keep reminding ourselves that we are the church. Everybody say, we are the church. Come on, take your right hand and say, we are the church. Don't hit your, don't hit your, all right. Pat yourself chest, say, I am the church, amen. Which means not that, you know, you get to take 1305 University Avenue, this building, and put it on your back and carry it around in every context you go to. But it does mean that we are called to be an ambassador, a representative, a, 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 a walking, breathing lighthouse, if you will. Anybody know what a lighthouse is? Amen. You know, uh, I, I, I take my daughter sometimes over to uh, Point Bonita. We used to go to the camp out there in uh, 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 Marin Headlands. And, you know, when you're a kid, you don't appreciate nothing. Praise God. You know, you just go along for the ride. You're just always looking for the next thing. When you become older, you begin to recognize and appreciate the, 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 the intri intri intricacies of, of, of the uniqueness of, of place and space. And so since we've been going over there to chase sunsets at times, there's a lighthouse right out there on the water. And the lighthouse was there uh, to make sure that when it was foggy and when it was stormy and you're out on the sea, it helped the ships and the captains who were travailing and trying to get through the tough waters to know that number one, there is a, 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 a end point to your journey. It was there, it had a foghorn usually, and it was there to also let you be able to use other senses, to be able to, to sense and to know that you were not lost. It was there to help you if all of your senses and your devices failed. The lighthouse was there to help you know that you're getting close to the shore. And you better slow up or slow down or make some plans or transitions. Or if you hit the rocks at the speed you're going through the storm, you may crash and sink. Well, how many of you know that I do believe that is one of the roles of the church? Both the, the collective church and we as the representatives of God's body. We are called to be God's representatives in the earth, on your job, at your school, in the park, in the clubs. I'm going to say amen. I'll be careful in these clubs now. Somebody say amen, right? <laughs> be like, really? Oh, you know, you got to take the Lord along with you everywhere you go. Now, you know, when I was growing up, there was no clubbing. Amen. Amen. You was just fasting and praying all day. Amen. Or if you went to the club, you didn't tell nobody. Somebody say amen. Was you at the club? No, you was like Peter at the, at the, at the, no, that wasn't me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. And if they ask you too many times, you get indignant. No, I got a doppelganger. You know, it wasn't, it was a twin. It wasn't me. Amen. Amen. But you know, it's the new church. Amen. So we don't show no judgment. We just tell you when you're there, everywhere you go, you are to be a lighthouse. A shining description of God's mercy, love, healing in the world. And we talk about the need to go back to church because for too many in our culture, in our world, dare I say even in our church, we have lost who we are called to be. And so we become many other things. 
And the church serves as a place of judgment and exclusion for those who are looking for God in all the wrong places. I mean, if Jesus is our greatest example, isn't it interesting that Jesus was able to attract everyone? Jesus attracted those who were on the margins. Jesus attracted those who were literally on the center. Jesus attracted the wealthy. He attracted the, the poor. Jesus attracted the in folks. He attracted the out folks. He attracted the soldiers. He attracted the activists. Jesus seemed to attract all of them just by being his authentic, divine self. Jesus was so much uh, in the center of who he was created to be that he didn't have to be a chameleon. He didn't have to shape shift. He just showed up and he just was who God created him to be. Well, I want you to know that we are the church and we have an identity, a calling. And it doesn't require you and I to necessarily be different kinds of people, be schizophrenic, be folks who don't, you know, what, you? You're, you, you, you are a Jesus follower? That ought not be people's description of you. Amen. Like, what, what, do, do you have a faith? Yeah, oh, I'm, I follow Jesus. Really? No, I think it ought to be indicative of how we treat one another, how we show up in the world. And when I say we have an identity crisis, I believe that our picture to the world too often is one of violence. We are a American expression of Christian faith that has no problem in taking the lives of other people. We are a expression of Christian faith in this country and context that has a short memory and often moves as if we are ahistorical. We are a people who have not been able to resist the lure of individualism and capitalistic kinds of endeavors that literally create the very conditions that the church was called to counteract. I mean, I just want you to think about this whole notion that in the body of Christ where there are no more Jew or Greek, there are no male and female, there are no more rich or poor, but all are one. How is it that we can claim to be a Christian nation and we have people living in tents in the most Christian, quote unquote, so-called wealthiest, I mean, we're not that wealthy because China owns all our debts, so I say amen, but we like to tell ourselves that. Right. And we have this sensibility that we throw around these words and these claims, but the evidence betrays us. And so when you and I show up to back to church, it's not just us coming to the building. It's also about us going back to being the church. What does it mean for you and I, for we to reclaim the church as God's creation, as God's unique carved out people to remind the world that God is still at work among all the ugliness around us. My hope and my prayer and my dream for the church, for the way, for all of us who are connected is to be a people that wherever we go, we don't have to announce that the church is here. Because people will always know and feel when the church shows up. That gentleness shows up. That peace shows up. That unity and harmony and healing shows up. But it shows up with a power and a divine infusion of God's spirit. It shows up in a way where people can feel you without having to hear you where people can see your works and actions without having to know the intent behind them, where people can understand the intellect and the brilliance and the innovation, but it is not an idol to you. It is something that is a reflection of the power of God at work in us. 
that when we get positions of, 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 of significance and authority, we are the most moral, we are the most honest, we are the most gentle, we are the most innovative to, to the glory and the honor of God. That we govern differently. Somebody say amen. That we not on the take and on the kickbacks. That we not out here lying and cheating and stealing because that's just the way it is. That we're not starting wars, that we're not funding wars, that we're not out here saying we serve the Prince of Peace, but in our day job, we ain't nothing but a warmonger. Uh -huh. We are God's chosen. That's the first thing. I want you to remind yourself that we have been chosen by God. Somebody say, God chose us. Say it again, God chose us. Now, this whole point of God choosing you ought not create a certain sense of arrogance. It ought not cause you to walk around with your nose, your chin up in the air. But what it ought to do is give you ultimate confidence. It ought to help you to have super high self-esteem. It ought to remind you that you are someone God has a special and unique purpose to achieve. You ought to be so cognizant that you are chosen by God that you, whenever you show up in a circumstance, you show up with a certain level of, 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 of purpose and functionality that you are not moved by the circumstances. Rather, you move the circumstances. Lord, have mercy. My pastor, he, he used to say to us, when purpose is not known, abuse is inevitable. And when we are a purposeless people, we are easily attaching or finding our things attached to us that are trying to fill a unique place that only God's purpose can fill. How many of us can look back through certain seasons of our lives and, and realize and admit that I was purposeless or less purposeful in this season of my life? The decisions I made during this season, you know, it was kind of a wing and a prayer moment. It was like, God, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, I'm just going to hope for the best. Amen. I'm going to try this on. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to see how this works and how this fits. But in moments of clarity, you begin to realize, no, nah, this is where I'm supposed to be. How many know that God has a place for you to be? And here at The Way, we like to often say that you belong here. Why? Because there is always a place for God's people in the house of God, that God's people can never be a guest in God's house. Hello, somebody. That you have been chosen by God to do a unique thing in the world, to fulfill a unique role in the world. And when you find out that unique role, that purpose, how many of you know that there's a certain then kind of formation process that is necessary to cultivate that uniqueness? God chose you not because God sees you as a finished product. God chose you because God knows who you were from the beginning and who you must be in order to be God's literal highest expression of yourself. You, we are God's handiwork. We talked about this a couple weeks ago with the potter and the clay. That God has a way of shaping us better than any other potter can. And while you can be a lump of clay and be shaped by many things, I'm one of these folks that want to be shaped by the God that chose me by the God that has an imagination for me, by the God who is able to take even the mistakes I make and make it a part of the best me. God chose us. And the us can never be lost in the I. And the I can never get lost in the us. But there must be a continual 
kind of movement of the individual and the collective. This is where serving a uh, a, a God theologically described as Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the triune God. Uh, it talks about an interdependent nature of existence, whereby one does not try to claim uh, power over the other, but they exist in a perichoretic theological word. I know y'all probably won't remember it. I just want you to know that our faith has thought through these things over the last couple thousand years. Somebody say amen. And it's a good model for us. That interdependence is the maximum appropriate arrangement for how we achieve God's purposes in the world. Which just means that we can do more together than we would if we were by ourselves. How many believe that in here today? Amen. How many ever been working on a project and you were, you know, trying to figure out how to get something done, but somebody came alongside you and they brought something to the table that you did not even know was possible? They cut down in the half what you thought was going to take your whole weekend. Sometimes it's good to know that the interdependent nature of our God is a paradigm for how we are called to live in the world. So question, if we know God has chosen us, what does this teach us about our value? If you know God has chosen you, how can you constantly remind yourself of this truth, particularly in a time and in an age where rejection and slight and marginalization are coming back in such a distinct way? What does it mean for us to remind ourselves that God has chosen us? Then the second thing, I've alluded to it already, but I'll say it again. We have purpose. Somebody say, I have purpose. Say it again. I have purpose. Verse number nine says that you have been set aside to be a royal priesthood, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own royalty. You have some unique kind of lineage that makes you much more than the individual sum of your part. I mean, we're all watching the world, or at least parts of the world, respond to the death of Queen Elizabeth. And it's a fascinating uh, 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 obsession that people have with the symbol of the modern era of imperialism and colonization. I mean, it's so interesting, you know, how the United States spends so much time obsessed with what's happening in England, you be thinking, didn't, didn't, didn't the origin story of the United States, <laughs> what, wasn't it to get away from England? <laughs> Man, we showed up. Whenever something happened in England, oh, today in London, oh, the Scottish Yard, I'd be like, Man. Why we don't hear about what's happening in Libya, praise God, and in Ecuador? And, you know, why don't we get some equal time up here in these streets? And I think it's just because, you know, there's a certain kind of, 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 of uh, allegiance even to the modes of oppression. How many know sometimes the devil you know, you, you be loving that devil more than the devil you don't know? Like, I'm used to this devil now. This new devil, I don't know. This new devil got some levels I ain't used to. <laughs> Somebody say amen. I'm not trying to minimize the geopolitical nature of, you know, England and United States and, and all these other countries in relation to the, all of the global powers that are trying to upset some things. But I am saying that it is so fascinating that we who are supposed to love democracy and freedom and independence seem to be in love with the queen. I was in Washington, D.C. this week, and they literally had the flags flown at half pole. And I was sitting there in my meeting. I was in a, in, in, in a, in a meeting and looking at the White House, and I just said to myself, man, I wonder did they fly these flags at half pole when Luther Vandross died? Praise God. <laughs> I don't know. When Caesar shot, you know, because, you know, folk die every day. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. 
What's the whole point? The whole point is we have a royal lineage that is much more profound than the royalty that is often contracted or constructed in this world depending on the oppression of others. That the hierarchies in this world are not intended to define the royalty that flows through your spiritual body. That you and I, when we are called God's royal priesthood, we are called to be a royal, a, a, a divine expression of God's activity in the world. Which just simply means wherever you go, you have privileges. Somebody say, I have privileges. You got some privileges. You, 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 you are able to walk into certain situations and because of your connected to God, you are able to assert through your spiritual connection to God, a certain kind of privilege. And it is important to remind yourself that whenever Jesus used Jesus' privilege, it was to set other people free. Oh, Lord, have mercy. When Jesus caught the woman in adultery, Jesus used his privilege to shame her accusers. And then he used his privilege to free the sister. How many of some of us got privilege, but we use our privilege to embrace our oppressors and to shame those who are vulnerable. But you and I are not called to be royal priesthood intercessors, people who stand in the gap because we are trying to assert power or domination for ourselves. But we are called to be a royal priesthood an intercessor, someone who brings the people's concerns to God. Can you imagine if on your job and in your family and in the neighborhood you understood I am a royal priesthood? that I am qualified to bring the, the needs of the people straight to God. I can intercede. I can pray. I can touch. I can have and say a word. Imagine if on your job everybody knew you as the greatest possible uh, 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 spokesperson for hope and peace and healing and unity. Versus the person that we can't wait to get to the water cooler during the lunch break. <laughs> to hear the latest drama, to feed the rumor mill, to, to get updated on, you know, who, I don't know. I don't know these people no more. Who Cardi B is, is in, who, 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 who Lil Wayne and, and, and the Beehive and all these, you know, you, you know, I mean, I'm not hating on that, but if that's the only update you can give somebody, I don't know if that's the royal priesthood God is talking about. You're a holy nation. We are a people within a people. We are a people within a people. Dr. King, he talked about it very powerfully in his speech, Transform Nonconformist. And he says that we are citizens of two kingdoms at the same time the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of earth the colony of time and the colony of eternity and there are moments where these kingdoms or colonies intersect but there are moments when they diverge and the question for us is when the colony of eternity whose king is Jesus and the colony of time whose ruler are the powers of wickedness and evil. When those colonies begin to pull away from one another, which colony will we hold fast to? That's a deep question. Amen. And I've been trying to ask God, Lord, help me to hold on to you and your ways when these worlds start to diverge. I'm good at it on some days, but there'll be other days where, you know, the colony of time arrest my tongue arrest my mind get in my heart and I need the Lord the Holy Spirit I need all of it to pull me back into purpose into alignment into being the church child of God as we come back to church my hope is that coming back to church is not just to come to church on Sunday appointment but it is a every day I wake up 
assignment. God, I want to be your representative. I'm not stunting or stressing off being perfect. Perfection is the enemy of grace. Did you know that? If you were perfect all the time, you wouldn't need God's grace. You wouldn't need God's mercy. So don't get caught up on perfection. Get caught up on faithfulness. God, how can I be faithful? How can I be more faithful to you in these moments? How can I be more faithful to the people you've called me to lead and to impact? And finally, beloved, it is indeed the case that you belong here in God's church. And this church belongs in the world. We're not a social club with all these walls that are exclusionary, but we are a, the, the greatest, the greatest uh, image of this to me in the Jewish scriptures in the Old Testament, if you will, is the tabernacle was created to literally be the moving presence of God with the children of Israel as they walked to and through the promised land. They didn't have a temple, so they had to have a tabernacle. And the tabernacle was held together by the priesthood. And so wherever the people went, the tabernacle went. Why? Because the tabernacle was the place where they knew they could meet God. So the tabernacle was intended to be out in life with the children of Israel. Sometimes I think we get it twisted. We think the church is the place, the fixed space in the city, in the world, where only God can move and only God's people can live out our purpose. But how many of you know we are the tabernacle of God? We are God's people. And God says you belong here. You fit here. Paul says it like this. We are many members. One body. Everybody say that. Many members. One body. Many members. One body. Look at your hands. Everybody just take your hands. Look at your hands. I hope you love your hands. I hope you love the tone, the skin color, the, the, the idiosyncrasies of your hands. I would take a look at your feet, but that may be a little too much. Tell you, look at the beard, look at your nose, and all these parts of your body together, they have a function and they make up the body. Can you imagine if your whole body was nothing but a hand? If your whole body was nothing but an ear? If your whole body was nothing but an eye? How limited your body would be. It wouldn't take anything away from all the seeing you could do. But how many know with all you would see, you would miss out so much of what you didn't hear? All that you would smell, you would miss out what you didn't taste. All you could feel, you would miss out by where you couldn't go. We are many members, yet one body. And the church is called to be out in the world functioning in different places and spaces, achieving the same goal. So my hope and my prayer, child of God, is as we come back to church, that we also leave to be the church. We don't have to be handing out tracts everywhere you go. That may be somebody's assignment. That may be, you know, you to hand, you to handing out the tracts. <laughs> Amen. But some of us, have a different assignment. Some of our assignment is to fight the power. Some of our assignment is to teach the babies. Some of our assignment is to serve the vulnerable. Some of our assignment is to love our children, our families, our partners. Some of our assignment is to save the climate. But whatever your assignment is, remember you belong to the body of God. Let's stand and pray and
invite ourselves to lean in to the song says Lord I'm available to you my will I give to you I'll do what you say do use me Lord to show And enable me to say My storage is empty And I am available to you Just lift those hands and Say it again Say, Lord, I'm available I'm available to you. My will I give. My, My will I, I give. To I'll you. do what you say, do. I'll do what you say. Use me, Lord. Use, Use me, Lord. Lord. To show someone the way. To show someone the way. And enable me to say. And enable me to say. My storage is empty. My, My storage is empty. And I am available. And, and I, I am available to you. God, I pray for all of us. We are your church. We are your people. And God, on a Sunday when we say we're coming back to church, I also pray, God, that we would be available to be the church, to be a chosen generation a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people called out by you to show forth the praises of the one who called us out of the gloom and the ugly and the hopeless into a marvelous light. God, we want to be available. Take our hands, take our eyes, take our ears, our mouth, our nose, our hands, our feet, our mind. Take every part of us, God so we can be used in your purpose. Somebody say, use me, Lord. Say it again, use me, Lord. So God, we pray right now, God, as we lift up our hands to you, Lord God, that you will use us in your service. Use us, oh God, in your kingdom, your kingdom. Use us wherever we are, whether we're on the schools, whether we are in the neighborhood, whether, God, we are in our therapist offices, whether we are God uh, serving the vulnerable, whether we are God helping to keep our city clean and healthy, whether we are in the medical profession, God, wherever we are, use us as an instrument of your will and your purpose. And we'll say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, God, that you make us available to you. Yes, our storage is empty, and I am available to you. You may be here today and you say, I, I need to make my life available to the Lord as I come back to church. I want to be the church. I want to be God's instrument in the world. You may say, I'm not yet giving my life to the Lord, and I want the Lord to live in me, to breathe in me, to move in me. I want to confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead. I want salvation. I want deliverance. I want healing for my mind, my body, my soul, and my spirit. If you're here and you need prayer, lift those hands high to the Lord. And right now, God, we engage you, God. We call your spirit to meet our hands as they're lifted to you, God. Reach down from heaven and touch us. Fill us with your spirit. Fill us with your healing. Fill us with your hope. Fill us with your power. Remind us, God, that before we were formed, God, you had a special call and a plan, and you knew who we were and who we were to be. God, and we'll say thank you. We'll say thank you for being your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Clap your hands, everybody. Let's just thank the Lord. Let's just thank the Lord.